Welcome back to part two. Yeah, this, this might seem a little bit different, um, but basically I'll, I'll be kind of weaving these, these two strands together at the end. So, um, the title of the talk is called 2012 Paradigm Shift. We did a little bit of an introduction to the mind clinical system, you know, what the relevance of 2012 is within that system. And uh, now I'm just going to talk a little bit about paradigm shift before we go into the main part of the second part, which is really actually about um, contemporary astronomy and discoveries that they're making about where we are and what's around us. Really, there's some really profound things happening on that level. But um, paradigm shift, I mean, you hear about it all the time. It's like, you know, the paradigm shift in training is this paradigm shift in this and that. It's like, basically, the pop culture phrase is kind of like obscured the meaning a little bit. The, the origin of the term actually comes from a book by Thomas Kuhn, uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which is really uh, one of the uh, most important books in the study of the history of science. It's like, you know, his idea was that um, science doesn't move forward in small increments. It's not always about like a little refinement on a theory, a little refinement on that theory. Um, there are times in science where basically huge breakthroughs happen. And when these huge breakthroughs happen, what occurs is the fundamental belief systems about our place in the universe and the nature of reality change. And they change in a way which is very specific. They change the way that basically the two systems can't be really measured together. It's like, like almost like the imperial system and the metric system. You can't really mix and match the units. So this is a very different idea from of science than a lot of people have. Because you know there's a, a popular idea about science that somehow this is a body of knowledge. Science isn't a body of knowledge, it's actually a method. And it's not a method uh, of uh, creating knowledge, it's a method of disproving things. That's actually what the scientific um, method is. It's basically a way of examining theories and disproving them rather than proving them. So when you get a paradigm shift, the key criteria of it is this huge word, it's a one dollar word called incommissionability. This very simply means two things that can't be measured. So you can say like Hamilton's and Pence to so the metric system would be an example. Different belief systems, different ways of viewing the universe. So a paradigm shift has that particular quality. So in the second part, what I'm going to talk about is um, some example, firstly, an example of a paradigm shift that changed the way that people view the world. And then basically my argument that we're now in the middle of a new paradigm shift. So Thomas Kuhn, in his book, had one particular favourite example of a paradigm shift, and it was this one. And it's called the Copernican Revolution. And what it was, in the, uh, um, in the early medieval times and previously in Roman and Greek times, the view of the world was that we were the centre of everything and that basically uh, all the planets and the sun revolve around us. And the diagram on the left is a diagram of exactly that. This is called the Ptolemaic worldview. Ptolemaic is our Ptolemy, and this is something that he espoused. So you've got the Earth at the centre, and then you've got planets moving around it, and you can't see it very well in this, but also the Sun is revolving around the Earth. So obviously that means we're very, very important. You know, we're at the centre of creation. We are literally at the centre. Now, there's one really inconvenient fact for this world, which is that if you look at the planets in the sky, as they move across the sky, they do something really strange. Which is that if you watch, for instance, Venus, uh, it goes across the sky and then it appears to stop. It goes backwards in a loop and then it stops again and then it moves forward. Now, this is um, the phenomenon of retrograde motion. And uh, Mercury went um, direct yesterday and it stopped being retrograde, so if you're familiar with Mercury retrograde and the effect that it has, I certainly am, you'll know that, that it's, uh, that's what was being talked about. Now, um, if we're at the centre and the planets are revolving around us, it's really difficult to explain. Why does it do that? Why does it, you know, once we just stop in the sky, move backwards, stop again and move forwards? It tr transcribes basically a, si a, a circle in the sky in this, in this period. And um, in medieval times, there was a huge amount of energy 
devoted to explaining this phenomenon, which they call the phenomenon of epicycles. So monks and academics would sit down and they create incredibly complex equations to prove how epicycles worked. And it basically was a vast body of like mathematical formula that basically very few people <coughs> understood at all. It was kind of a, a bit of a kind of like almost joking point. Then um, Galileo invented the telescope. Copernicus came along shortly after that. And he, he came up with a really simple, really brilliant, encompassing idea, which is that, well, you know, if you put the sun at the center and we're actually moving around the sun, you don't need any of these epicycles. All of these motions explain themselves from that point of view. Now, the problem with that is that it fundamentally challenged the church's doctrine that we are the center of creation. So he wasn't particularly popular, and uh, he was lucky not actually to be burned at the stake, uh, but died in obscurity. Now, the thing about that idea was that this is a genuine paradigm shift, because it does two things. Firstly, it explains the world in a completely different way. It changes the way that we see um, our reality and our position within it. And it moves into a, a different realm. It's basically the power of an idea that whose time has come, that's you know, that expression. And you know, the, the qualities of like these ideas that appear at a particular time are always the same. They're always simple. They're always more simple than the complex explanations that preceded them. And they are more encompassing. They're larger. So, you know, this was a really fundamental shift. Now, if you were living in the time of Copernicus, you probably wouldn't have seen much of that because, you know, from the point of view of the average person, they were so embedded in the Ptolemaic or geocentric worldview that this was really only trickling down to, to them over a longer period of time. So, uh, what the really interesting thing about this is, is that this was an obscure monk coming up with a theory that wasn't popular in his own time and who died in obscurity. But the idea was so good and so powerful that within 150 years, what you saw in European society was the end of the supremacy of the church and the rise of the nation states as basically the power base in Europe. So a simple scientific discovery within 150 years caused a cultural revolution. And that is a paradigm shift. So, I'm going to suggest that we're in a paradigm shift at the moment, and that it's based on this. Currently, effectively, we're in the Copernican worldview. It's the view that the sun is at the center, and the planets orbit around it, as you can see here. But there are two things that are really challenging this viewpoint. One of which is an understanding of the mind political system, especially with the galactic alignment theory. Because in order to encompass that idea, we have to expand our notion of time. We have to expand our notion of our place in the universe. Now, we don't actually have to claim that Maya knew what the galaxy was. They may have done it. We don't know. What we're actually saying is that they were smart enough to observe this cycle and to basically uh, see that, that uh, you know, this 25,771 year cycle could be marked very precisely with a stop start date when the wolf and the solstice conjuncts the galactic equator, as we showed in the first half. But there's another set of ideas which are coming and completely challenging the way that we view the world, which are coming from the world of um, contemporary astronomy. And um, basically, this worldview is collapsing. And it's collapsing because we are exploring further and further away from this model to the perimeters of the sound, to the perimeters of the solar system. And also we're, we're taking a much, much closer look at things like the asteroid belt and the behavior of our sun. And what we're learning is that we can't really explain what's going on on the sun. And consequently, we can't really explain what's going on on this planet unless we actually remove our context into a bigger frame of reference. And that frame of reference is the galaxy. So on the right-hand side, what you see 
is what I call the emerging galactocentric worldview. So, you know, we are approximately kind of about here in the galaxy. We're actually moving around the galaxy in an orbit, and it's a vast thing with many, many millions of suns. It takes us many hundreds of millions of years to actually make that orbit. But instead of being, you know, originally the situation was that we thought of ourselves as the center of creation, and in the Copernican worldview, we think of ourselves as one of a privileged elite. There's seven planets or nine planets, and the sun is at the center. But now, actually, what, what's happening is we're discovering that the behavior of the sun, the behavior of our planet, is largely affected by the galaxy. The galaxy is a much, much bigger context. So we have this, um, you know, I, I remember at school, I was really fascinated by, the, you know, the, the diagram of the solar system that you'll find in, in an average textbook. We've got the sun at the center and you've got the planets moving around it. And I thought, this is great because, um, you know, it says here that the uh, sun is going to keep burning for the next 3.5 billion years. There's nothing really to worry about. It's a very stable clockwork universe. Now, um, that's all great, but actually, it's not accurate at all because the sun is moving. And this is something we don't think about often, but as we move around the sun at a certain rate, so the sun is moving around the galaxy. And the rate at which the sun is moving around galaxies is actually much, much faster even than the rate at which our planet is orbiting around the sun. So because you've got this orbit effect, and we are basically part of the solar system, actually a much, much better way of seeing how actually our reality is, is to look at this kind of diagram. So what you have on this arrow in the center is the direction of the sun's orbit around the galaxy. And these spirals are the movements of planets. So the idea that we move in a circle and everything's very stable and repeats and repeats isn't correct. Actually, what's happening is that the sun is moving, and that means that all of the planetary orbits are always going to be spirals. So if there's one principle, no, contend that there is, all the new paradigm, the core principle is the movement of the sun. That's what we call the heliacal motion through galactic space. Now that idea is the pivot of the paradigm shift. And it's very much similar to the way in which the last paradigm shift, Copernican Revolution, worked. So you have a very, very simple idea put forward by somebody. And you can almost say, well, why, why is that kind of wrong? Why should we care? But actually, because it's simpler and more expansive than the previous paradigm, what actually is happening is that this view, this view of a spiral in the universe, of a spinning uh, motion that is perpetual and moving forward, what that actually contains is basically the principles of which we are kind of like moving into as a society. So, this worldview, if we embrace it, is basically something which is going to transform the way that we see our reality. Because previously, we were this privilege to be back in the geocentric days, we're the center of everything. In the heliocentric days, we're one of the club of seven, and we think everything, else, all the other planets are dead. That's a very strange idea. I always thought that was like one of the weirdest things. Like, you know, how do you know they're dead? You know, it's like, well, how do you define life anyway? That's a bit of a tangent. But. This is not a contradiction of, of the heliocentric paradigm. It's just, it's just putting it the same thing without modification in a bigger context. Well, that is a paradigm shift, and that basically is what I'm talking about. It's not a contradiction, you know, it's, it's a shift in, in the, basically... Copernican to Ptolemy is a total contradiction. They're, they're, they're different things. This is just a bigger context, surely. Uh, no, it's fundamentally different, because what, you, what both of these do is they move the center of our reality. And what it's done in one fell swoop, you see, what you're not seeing here is that the center of our reality is no longer the sun. The center of our reality is the galactic center, not, not the, the sun itself. Mm -hmm. So instead of it being like we're orientating around the sun, actually what we're doing now is we're orientating around a new center, which is the galactic center. And because we're doing that, 
what happens is this amazing dilation. Instead of it being like we're one of the twelve of seven or nine, we're actually one of the twelve billions. There are many, many millions of stars. There are many, many habitable, potentially habitable planets around those stars for carbon-based life forms, or whatever we are. So it's a fundamental shift in center, and that really is the key to a paradigm shift. It's not necessarily just the contradiction. You know, those two previous worldviews were coming out of an idea of what the center is. So you know, the Earth was the center, the Sun was the center, and now it's moved to the galactic center. This has been known since the 20s, though, isn't it? Well, the necessary necessary forms has been known in a considerable, a considerable period, but what we're actually living through now is basically the articulation of this idea in a way that's irresistible. And I'll, I'll go into this. Can I quickly wonder what the galactic center actually is? Is it just a, a place in space, or is that a silly question? Well, there are different galactic centers. There's the center of, uh, of mass, there's a the radio center, you know, but there's, there's different things. I think that it's a vast system. It's basically uh, the, uh, you can see it's like the, uh, the point at which all of the other stars are coordinatedly moving around. Right, it's not as tangible as the sun. Nice. Well, we don't really know. There's a theory that it's a massive black hole. I think that's a fairly contestable one. Uh, there are other you know, ideas that it could be a white hole. I mean, certainly the sense is that the galactic center is constantly creating energy, that it's a, it's a, you know, it's a creative force, basically. So this is a picture of the galaxy. Our current location is kind of on the Sagittarius arm, which is kind of leaving the as we move around the galaxy. And um, it's basically 26,000 light years into the center. And we move around the galaxy at approximately 26,000 light years in, in, a, in a fairly stable circular orbit. So it's just kind of give us, giving us perspective. There are hundreds of millions of stars, and it's thought that there are at least 100 million planets for the habitable potential. I would contest that that's because we're not imaginative enough to see the fact that there's life everywhere. Um, why is it important? Why should we care about this? Okay, there's a galaxy out there. Yeah, it's like we're revolving around it. So what? Okay, this is research done by the Open University. What it shows is this is just a schematic diagram of the galaxy. And basically, this here is the orbit of the Sun. Now, this orbit takes 225 million years to complete. So the planet itself has only done it you know, a small number of times in, in its totality. And what the Open University found was that this cycle has a profound influence on what happens on our planet because they charted major extinction cycles, and this is the first major one 500 million years ago. What they found is that major extinction cycles correspond to the points at which we enter or leave the spiral arms of the galaxy. And there, there occur basically six or seven of them, and all of them to be found basically when we're entering or leaving one of the spiral arms. It's particularly has this thing for a sun and a solar system to do. So if you look here, this is um, the, the dinosaur extinction 65, 65 million years ago. And that was basically the point at which we left the Sagittarius arm of the galaxy. And you know, the good news is that like the, the probability of a major extinction event is actually quite diminished at the moment. But this is something that we basically uh, need to understand in order to understand how evolution works on our planet because in contemporary science extinction is a synonym for evolution you know we're here because the dinosaurs became extinct so this is something which is basically fundamentally defining what's happening on our planet and it's happening over a very very large period of time but the interesting thing about the galactic paradigm is that it does two things at once. And this is typical of an expansion of awareness. There's a dilation which is really massive into a sense of there being like really huge cycles. So, you know, this idea that the world's going to end because we've reached the end of the processional cycle is humorous from a galactic point of view because actually what it is is that we are just emerging from a medieval Christian worldview. A medieval Christian worldview that's suppressed ruthlessly the observation of the cycles of nature. And this can be shown by, like, for instance, like the Inquisition, where the, you know, millions of witches were burned simply because they were following moon cycles. So, this as a culture is basically like, you know, we are coming from a perspective of being really 
impoverished in a, in a sort of temporal sense. And we're, we're basically moving into a position where our awareness is now dilating into much, much, much longer periods of time. Because whether we like it or not, we're part of the Earth. And the Earth is part of the Sun. And the Sun is part of the galaxy. And these things are basically like the givens of our situation. So, you know, we are on this orbit, and it basically takes us 225 million years. We orbit up and down with regards to the, um, the actual equatorial plane of the galaxy, too, over a 35 million year period. And we should begin, be getting interested in basically where we're going, because nothing is standing still in our system. We are moving as a planet around the sun, and our planet is moving in a spiral path as it follows the sun around the galaxy. So everything is in motion. You know, the, the old geocentric model was that we are the center, and at the center nothing, nothing is moving, and nothing can be further from the truth. In fact, the galaxy is moving as well. The galaxy is actually moving even more, even faster than the sun is moving, the galaxy is moving. So, you know, this is a remarkable picture of like different layers of motion. And this is what determines uh, evolution and extinction on our planet. And it's basically why we're here. So, you know, this is basically the context that we're expanding into. And the collapse of the old neocentric worldview and the idea of linear time that basically coexisted for the last few hundred years is really just uh, under huge amounts of kind of like uh, just structural kind of uh, demolition. Just simply because we're actually beginning to do something that I was contesting that the megalithic and uh, mind cultures were always doing, which is observing what's out there. And my favorite way of doing that at the moment, uh, apart from looking up in the night sky, is actually tracking what some of the, uh, the probes are doing uh, who are exploring our solar system and beyond. So um, I said that you know that there's this dilation in this expansion of awareness in the literal form, which is basically that what we have happening here is that our worldview, our, our time sense is collapsing, and the, what is replacing it is, is, is the, the previous slide, which is a much bigger time scale, this 225 million year cycle, but actually one of the, one of the other kind of myths that we live with is also rapidly collapsing. This is the kind of micro time scale. And the myth is that space is empty. And space is empty went along with the sun as the center. Because it was like the sun is the center and space is empty and therefore we don't have to worry or think about these things. But actually, um, research by the Russian Academy of Sciences and by Alexei Dmitriev over the last 10 years has shown that a large amount or a large increase of energy it's called plasma. It's been entering into our solar system over the last 10 years. In fact, it's a tenfold increase. It's a really, really substantial amount. So this is a picture of what our star looks like as it moves around the galaxy. So you see that space is empty. It's full of energy. The plasma is basically the fourth state of matter. It's a highly um, energized, uh, kind of like a, a electrified gas, is the way to think about it. And in terms of the composition of our galaxy, in fact, the universe, 99% of all matter is plasma. So we have the sun at the center of this bubble, and around it is a big energetic bubble called the heliosphere, and it forms a kind of protective energetic membrane around our star system as it moves, so that um, the, uh, the cosmic particles that we interface with the plasma is largely deflected by the energetic um, matrix of, of the sun itself. Well, this is normally the case, but as you can see on the front here, there's a bow shot, which is this wave of compressed plasmic energy, which is on the front end of the heliosphere. Now, NASA has shown uh, that this 